I've given a talk in a room with tiered seating. <laughs> uh, so this is also the smartest I've ever felt. Um, so Cody's right, my background is in cognitive psychology and uh, computer science and my master's in human-computer interaction, uh, all from Carnegie Mellon, which if you haven't heard of it, is the school that you go to if you get rejected from MIT. <laughs> um, but my business card has always said designer. Um, I've always worked in design firms, most recently for continuing about the West Union. Um, which speaks to, I think, in the time you've been working on this, if you pull the slide up as soon as I'm done with the sentence. Ah, there we go. Um, was that the definition of design is changing a little bit. Design has become more relevant in the past few years than it has been in, in the decades prior, uh, for a couple of reasons which we, can, we can talk about at the end if you guys are interested. But um, So I want to talk very briefly about that, but mostly, I know that you guys have a short period of time, so I want to, I want to talk to you about how you can squeeze good 24 hours out of a designer. Um, so back in the day, we only used to use design methods to, to make stuff. Um, and uh, especially around the Industrial Revolution, it became really important to be able to um, have some methodology around making things not on an individual basis. So before the Industrial Revolution, you know, if you needed a shoe, you went to the shoe maker and he made you a shoe for you. Or after the, after the Industrial Revolution, we needed to make millions of shoes that were going to have broad appeal, broad enough that it was worth our money to produce them, and then people would come buy the ones that most suited their needs. So designers did a lot of stuff like this. Um, it was largely about aesthetics, uh, largely about form, desirability, and, and making people really want, want to buy your product. Um, but now, because of the increasing relevancy of design, we sort of accidentally figured out that the methods that we used to use to design stuff are actually pretty useful for helping us solve a whole variety of business problems. And the new model of design looks a little bit more like this, um, which you'll notice is much more conceptual than it is physical, where on the right we have your company, um, and you know, in the red we call that the back of house, which I suspect is what you guys have probably been working on, the, the, um, the contestants, is that the word? <laughs> teams? <laughs> the teams or contestants or... Um, whatever. That's probably what we've been working on, I suspect, for the past uh, couple months, which is you know, really getting your business model down, your technology, your operations. Um, and then there's this thing called the front of house, which in, uh, is a sort of a complex relationship between your business and your customer, which is spread out over these, these white dots here, which are a variety of touch points. And really, your product is only one of those touch points. The other ones are things like, you know, down to your business card, your website, your your call your call center staff. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many of you have an HP printer, but I have the opinion that they tend to make pretty good products. But when I when they break, and I call the customer support center, and I'm on the phone for two and a half hours, it's incredibly frustrating, and it makes me think twice about buying an HP printer the next time, even though I think they make the best printers. So, so design is involved in, in creating, understanding, and uh, evolving this relationship. But I, I just want to sort of frame the conversation that way because I, you know, I know you guys are going to have a variety of different needs out of your designers, but we only have 24 hours, and so I wanted to go quickly through a couple of principles um, that I think will help you make the most out of uh, this afternoon and tomorrow. Um, the first is to have a goal, and to have the, the teams work together with their designers to come up with that goal. So working in the design industry, we hear a lot of requests like uh, to add some sizzle to the state, whatever the hell that means. Or, you know, it's got to be a game changer, like, like the iPod. We want the iPod of the, you know, connected home appliances industry. Or, you know, we gotta make, we got to take this pitch deck that's got all the right numbers in it and make it pop. Um, but what I want to ask you guys to do, because these things are um, sort of meaningless, and in case any of you were like, you're going to ask your designers to make it pop, you now can't because I made fun of it on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, the question I want the designers to ask is why. And I don't want you to ask that question because you're, you're trying to change your team's goal. But I want you to understand what is the business reason that, they, that it needs to pop. Something shouldn't pop just to pop. Design for design's sake is, is art, and that's not what we're doing this weekend. We are trying to drive business results through the application of design principles. So if your pitch deck is, is, is awesome, but it's lame, and it needs to look better, think hard about why it needs to look better. 
Does it need to connect emotionally with your audience and give them a really, really expose the customer need and sort of this really attract them to want to give you money? Um, if your website needs to look better, is it because you, you, uh, people need to understand what it is? A lot of technology products have a, a huge hurdle to get over that they're super, super useful, but only nerds understand what they are and why they're useful. So um, I just I wanted, I wanted to kind of facilitate that conversation. Secondly is choose criteria for success. A big problem, I won't say problem, but uh, an issue we face all the time in the design industry is it's really hard to know if you did it right or not. Because there, there are never really any right answers in this, in this business. Which is probably true of business and entrepreneurship as well, unless you make like six billion dollars by the time you're 26. <laughs> um, but the company Quicken, back in the early 90s, back when we weren't even really sure about this like internet and computer thing, made a killer app by focusing um, almost maniacally on a metric for design success. So this is a time, I don't know if you guys remember, you know, back in the early 90s, it took sometimes like an hour to install software. It was a huge pain in the ass. But Quicken came out and said, here's, here's, here's the goal that we're going to focus on. If you do nothing else right, we're going to do this right. You're going to be able to buy our software at the store back when the software still came in a box. You'll bring it home, unpack it, install it, and be able to print the check within 15 minutes. And if it can't do that, I'm not shipping the product. And so they focused on that, and they did it, and they nailed it. And Quicken became one of the early killer apps for the PC. So I want you guys to think about that. What are your metrics for success? You know, so there are a couple of different kinds. Um, you know, maybe you have a, a, a PowerPoint presentation that's too nerdy, and you want to make it a little cooler and slicker. So, you know, a box you can check at the end is, have we used as few words as possible? Um, does it need to be lightweight? Maybe you have a physical product, and you have an industrial designer who needs to trim physical fat off your product. Um, emotional. I want to be proud of it. It's a key, it's, and I can tell you from all the sales meetings I've done, it's much easier to get in front of a group of people and sell a product when you really believe in it and you're really proud of it. And so maybe for you, that's the box you need to check. I want to be proud enough of my product that I can stand behind it in front of it very confidently. And finally, there's the more kind of quantitative um, efficiency metrics. Um, we have an improved conversion rate on our website, and we think design can help us do that. Or um, we have certain tasks that we, we need users to do very quickly and efficiency, uh, efficiently. To, um, to keep them engaged. Um, third is to be able to articulate constraints. So uh, this is a little cartoon where a guy is saying, uh, you can imagine he was just being pitched the idea of an underwater barbecue, and he says, just a couple of thoughts. First, does it have to be underwater? And second, does it have to be a barbecue? <laughs> um, which, is, which is classic designer, classic marketing. Does anyone recognize what this is from? Sweet, good. Uh, it's it's from Dilbert, and uh, in my industry, like the most overused business joke you can over overused business cliche thing you can do is put a slide from Dilbert in your PowerPoint deck. So I, I drew it and stole the content and, uh, <laughs> and didn't get caught. But this is good. Well, this, two points. Um, one, designers be able to understand what the real constraints are. So <laughs> you know, it, uh, it's, it's not efficient for you to completely refocus what the entrepreneurs have tried to do so far. Um, however, sometimes, and I'm, I'm a technical person, technical people get stuck in a particular path because they care about the technical aspects. And a designer from an outside perspective can push on some of those constraints and, and decide if they're actually real constraints or not. Um, I was talking with a group of students from MIT actually two weeks ago, super, super smart, not surprisingly. Um, and one, one of the groups had what they thought was a technical challenge where they were really trying to get over this, this hump of it needs to be a browser plug, it needs to be a browser plug, it needs to work this certain way. And uh, coming from the outside, one of the design students in the room was like, well, why does the user have to know that it's a browser plug? Like, it was a, it was a product almost literally for four soccer moms to help them raise money for their children's soccer teams. Like, <laughs> they don't necessarily know what a browser plugin is. So, you know, um, the way it works and the way it appears to work can be completely different things. So these are just a couple of different types of constraints that you guys are uh, want to be thinking about. It. You know, political, um, 
human factors, customer specific. I know that in certain markets, certain colors and certain words are, have different connotations than they do here in the United States. Um, brand, do you have the right to, to, to play in that space? You know, um, Or does your company have a personality that you need to make sure comes through on whatever your touch point is? So um, I want you guys to think about that and be able to articulate that. And the final one is, is to prioritize ruthlessly against your success criteria. And I, I use the word ruthless um, because one of the hardest things to do in design, particularly in a, in a complex product, is making trade-offs between potential features. Um, I saw a really good, <laughs> I feel like I'm saying it already, I saw a great tweet the other day about <laughs> how um, as you add complexity to a product, a lot of times it's because you don't know where your value really lies. So you're like, you know, firing, this is, this is a horrible paraphrase, but you're, you're firing buckshot and trying to hit something. So you're spreading your value as thin as you can, um, rather than focusing on really what is my core value proposition and, and hammering on that. And it's, uh, it wouldn't be a presentation by a designer who didn't feature a shout out to Apple, who, to, who has been famous for, for their ruthless um, uh, focus on the right features rather than all the features. This is the MacBook Air. Which a lot of people, which pissed a lot of people off when it came out because it doesn't have a CD-ROM drive, right? Um, and that's because when looking at the feature of maybe we'll get a few more people if we add a CD-ROM drive, versus no, we're going to please the people we are really aiming to please, who really want a light, tiny computer. Um, and this is the market they were focusing on: the tiny computer market, not the maybe I kind of also want a portable DVD player market. They were also looking ahead to when CDs and DVDs aren't going to exist anymore. So it was brilliant on a couple different um, dimensions. But, but most importantly, it's about knowing who your customer is and making trade-offs that are very specific to them. Because the more people you try to please, um, you actually Bill Cosby said it. You know, entrepreneurial scholar Bill Cosby <laughs> said, I don't know the key to success, but the key to failure is trying to please everybody. Which was in my high school yearbook. <laughs> Which makes it right. So, <laughs> so to recap, um, I want you guys to think about the following four things. One, have a goal and frame it together. Choose criteria for success. Be able to articulate your constraints and prioritize ruthlessly against your success criteria. Um, at that point, thanks for having me, and I want to open up to any questions you guys have. Yeah. Are you going to distribute the presentation? Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, we can we can put it on the hundred K website if that was official. <coughs> no, sometimes it's yeah. it's proprietary. <laughs> yeah.